Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. You're part of the 200 people worldwide who reach straight to this webcast powered by Yield Development, System Plus Consulting, and Nomade. This webcast deals with the 5G impact on the, tele on, the tele well, on the telecommunication industry from RF infrastructure to mobile front ends. My name is David Jordan. I'm Global Sales Support and Coordination Manager for Yield Development and I will present this webcast. So before we start the webcast, let me give you some basic information on this online event. You have the possibility to submit questions during the webcast. You can use the Ask a Question window at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions today as we can, and for the remaining ones, we will follow up with you via email. So at the end of the webcast, there will be a Q&A session. Concerning the materials that we will present, uh, please note that the presentation are already available. They can be downloaded from the resources section of the platform. Furthermore, you will receive tomorrow an email with the link to the recorded webcast session. So let's start the webcast with Antoine Bonabel, Technology and Market Analyst, RF Devices and Technology Actual Development. Antoine? Yeah. The floor is yours. So, uh, welcome everybody to this webcast. My, the, the title of my presentation will be uh, the Telecom Infrastructure uh, RF Frontend Evolution. So, I will start by quickly defining what we call uh, telecom, uh, uh, telecom infrastructure. So, uh, basically, we see uh, three kinds of, uh, of systems uh, in our vision of uh, the telecom infrastructure, which are uh, the macro base station systems you can see in the top of towers it's, um, it's devices radiating uh, quite far 2.5 kilometers or up to 1.6 miles uh, they um, can radiate uh, quite high powers so up to 480 watts uh, so these devices are the one uh, you can see in, yeah, in uh, rural areas or on top of tall buildings then you also have now what we call uh, low-density small cells. It's uh, smaller devices, the same kind of uh, technology, but uh, with lower power levels um, radiating at lower distance. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the future, uh, what we call high-density small cells. So it's a very small, uh, it's very, very small systems uh, radiating at up to 50 meters, uh, which will be used mostly for millimeter waves uh, in the future. So when we talk about uh, evolution, what, uh, what do we mean? Uh, in, the 4G, uh, in the 4G era, uh, most of the systems used were uh, passive antenna systems with what we call a remote radio head. So remote radio head was, um, uh, is, uh, the, well, it's a, a part of the, of the system that's, uh, the, the, that's not directly uh, inside the antenna, but uh, just next to it. And inside uh, this part, you have the RF front end amplifying the signal. So you have the signal, uh, so signal streams uh, coming from the transceiver that's amplified uh, at high power, uh, high power level and sent to the antenna for, for, for radiation. Uh, but now what we start to see is uh, active antenna systems. So it's systems uh, with instead of uh, two to four um, uh, RF chains, so, uh, 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 so RF lines amplifying the signal, you start to see up to 64 uh, independent uh, RF chains, uh, all linked to 64 antenna elements. Uh, and this uh, permits uh, what's called beamforming. Uh, beamforming is the ability to create a directive uh, beam uh, toward a single user equipment, uh, thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, well, um, Interest interferences, constructive and destruct destructive interferences, uh, acting uh, with the, the sense signal. And to perform so, you need to be able to uh, deface, to modulate your signal at uh, each antenna, uh, antenna element level. So for this, you, have, you get up to 64 uh, independent uh, RF chains, and that's a big difference compared to what's been seen before, as uh, well, you have uh, 32 uh, times more uh, RF chains and uh, power levels are therefore 32 uh, less high, uh, well, lower. Uh, the other evolution is the appearance of uh, millimeter wave small cell. 
uh, these devices were not existing in the existing before, and they are mis mostly uh, made thanks to uh, MMICs, so um, monolithic uh, microwave integrated circuits, uh, in which uh, up to four RF chains, uh, uh, four to eight RF chains are um, are designed and address uh, large uh, large panels of um, of antenna arrays. Um, uh, let's go a bit uh, a bit deeper in the in the architecture. So if we compare uh, the um, macro macro systems, so those systems you can see on uh, on top of buildings, uh, so namely the macro macro base stations and the low density small cells. Formerly you had these remote radio heads, and now you can start to find uh, active antenna systems. So there are two principal differences between the two uh, the two approaches. The first difference is that, uh, as I said before, the power level are way lower. So one RF chain, uh, RF chain, an RF chain is basically a set of components, so um, uh, a set of uh, power amplifiers and uh, uh, LNA and, um, and, and and filters. So um, two RF chains uh, uh, radiating, let's say, 120 watts at uh, at uh, power amplifier level. Uh, now you can find uh, with the system 64 RF chains radiating 3.75 watts at uh, amplifier level. And the second important uh, uh, difference is the fact that you now need a beamforming module in your system. With the remote radio head based uh, systems, you only have the amplifi uh, amplifying system, so the RF front end. And with active antenna system, you have to add the beamforming. So what exactly does, it, does this mean? If you look at uh, standard uh, remote radio head, you have, uh, so it's very basic, only a few set of components. Uh, before, for amplification, you see a pre-driver, driver, a door tip or amplifier that goes through the, uh, and then the signal goes through the circulator to the antenna. And on the relative path, uh, one uh, high power switch and uh, a low noise amplifier gain block to, to reach the transceiver. So uh, in practice, if you look at, uh, at the actual example, so here is the Air Harmony um, uh, front-end module for Ben 41 uh, remote radio head. Uh, you can see that you have some uh, large uh, amplification uh, components, and, uh, but only a few components that are used uh, in, uh, in quite large, uh, quite large uh, system, and this represents uh, one single uh, RF chain. So if we compare that to what's now happening in the active antenna system world, so uh, for active antenna systems, uh, you have 64 RF chains and not uh, two, uh, just two RF chains. It means that you have uh, a set of 64 beamformer modules. So it means uh, a beamformer module is basically either an attenuator or a variable gain amplifier. Uh, next to a phase shifter in order to uh, to modulate the signal so it can uh, interfere with the, the, other, the signal coming from other RF chains. So you have uh, one beamformer module per RF chain. It means that you have now 64 beamformer modules that have to be added to the um, to the bill of material, and uh, each one of these modules is linked to uh, uh, a transceive and a receive path. So it adds uh, 64 um, RF switches, local RFC switches, that were not featured in the remote radio heads, and uh, 128 uh, gain blocks uh, that were also not featured in, uh, in remote radio heads. On the, um, on the amplification part, the amplification is a bit uh, more simple than uh, in, uh, in uh, remote radio heads, as you only need uh, two stages uh, of amplification, so driver or amplifier, but in general it's uh, still the same, um, the same architecture, but uh, repeated 64 times. So lower power of the uh, components, but uh, in a higher number. So as an example, let's see also for the Ben 41, the Samsung Massive MIMO uh, unit. So if you look at, uh, at, this, uh, at this board, you can see that indeed you have 64 times uh, this uh, RF chain, so this power amplifier, driver, circulator, uh, that are linked to 64 uh, beamformer modules themselves linked to 16 uh, transceivers and uh, four uh, DPN processing units. So uh, very quickly uh, for, the, um, for the millimeter wave small cells, it's a bit different in this case because it's uh, smaller powers, power radiated, and uh, what's happening is that it's all integrated in, uh, in monolithic uh, microwave uh, integrated circuits. So you find, uh, in general, uh, the beamformer, deep power amplification, and uh, everything that's needed uh, featured in a single chip 
uh, with uh, four RF chains, no eight RF chains uh, embedded in one single chip uh, that you multiply on the on the board to uh, obtain your uh, up to 64 RF chains. Um, so uh, market-wise, how does this translate? We uh, we we well, we tracked uh, all the different components. We did our estimation for the, the market evolution and uh, the market evolution linked to 5G. And what we saw is that uh, we expect and we start to see a growth in the in the RF uh, component market for uh, for the telecom infrastructure. A growth that may, that should stop uh, past 2022. So this growth doesn't come from uh, an increased number of antenna systems that are deployed. Actually, we expect the same same number of antenna systems to be deployed, but uh, a higher uh, bill of material uh, for active antenna systems. Uh, indeed, as uh, as I said, uh, in active antenna systems, you need beam formers, so you need switches, you need uh, more gain blocks, and you have a higher number of LNAs. So these components were not featured in, in remote radio at end, uh, are directly added to the active antenna system. And also for the, um, the poor amplification, uh, poor amplifiers for active antenna systems, uh, they use highly integrated uh, DORT, uh, do, 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 um, DORT designs, uh, which are more expensive on a, watt per, on a dollar per watt ten point, uh, which means that in the end you still see a uh, um, higher value coming from the, the, the poor amplification, final stage poor amplification in active antenna systems than in a remote radio. Rate. Uh, we estimate this growth to stop by 2022 uh, just because we think that uh, that's when the uh, market penetration for active antenna systems uh, will, uh, will flatten. So uh, past this date, uh, we expect uh, remote radio heads and uh, active antenna systems to uh, share the market and their speed should not move more much uh, afterwards. Uh, the market coming from millimeter wave uh, should start uh, after 2022, and it will still be very low compared to, uh, to the, other, uh, the other markets and the other devices. And what we uh, also looked at is the um, technology split for these different components, because uh, due to the, um, well, as you lower the, the, the power levels, uh, you, and as you need no uh, more, more devices, uh, low power devices, you uh, also change the, 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 the platform speed. Uh, let's take, for example, the example uh, of uh, RF switches. Uh, with standard systems, you need uh, high power switches uh, addressed by pin diodes. But now, uh, with the need for, uh, for switches in beam formers, so at low power level, you start to find uh, RF silicon and sapphire coming back and uh, RF, um, RF SOI appearing uh, for this uh, particular uh, use. So uh, in this context, uh, some technology platform uh, start to be used, and uh, some uh, some others start to start to grow. So uh, we dived into these uh, different platforms and uh, and performed an estimation of the, the market growth for each platform. So from a market of uh, estimated estimated market of, of 1.48 billion in 2018, we expect a growth to 2.5 billion in. Uh, 2025, and with uh, the largest growth uh, coming from uh, from uh, materials that are not the, stand, the, the standard LDMOS. It's, uh, for example, uh, materials like uh, uh, CD, uh, like uh, yeah, silicon germanium, uh, that should grow up to 360 million uh, US dollars with a 46% CAGR. Uh, or, for example, let's say that uh, RF uh, silicon uh, silicon uh, silicon and insulator. Uh, which should grow to uh, 164 million uh, with a 68 percent CAGR. On its side, the LDMOS should stay flat as it's mostly used for the main power amplification um, um, of the, the systems, and uh, uh, there should not be, uh, as the number of antenna systems should remain quite stable, the need for power amplification should remain so. So in the end, uh, well, it, uh, the, the trend toward uh, active antenna systems, well, it offers actual market perspectives for, uh, for platforms such as uh, Gallium Arsenide, Silicon Germanium, or RF uh, Silicon and Sapphire. And uh, that's, uh, well, that, that, that's, uh, that's a good sign for, for the compound semiconductor industry in particular. So, well, okay, thank you very much, uh, Antoine, for your presentation. Once again, feel free to ask uh, questions that could be uh, answered during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. 
Now let's continue with uh, Stefan Elisabeth, expert cost analysis at System Cost Consulting. Stefan, the floor is Thank yours. you, David. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Sister, uh, Stéphane Elisabeth, cost engineer at System Plus Consulting, and I'm in charge of RF and advanced packaging, uh, and I will present the impact of the 5G technology on smartphones based on our teardowns uh, realized by System Plus Consulting. So to begin with, let me present the architecture. In the past, the implementation of the 3G communication has bring a quite simple ar architecture. Uh, 4G communication was mainly implemented as described. Um, uh, a main path with PMID uh, and a diversity, diversity path drive by diversity module. And this is what this was true for high, mainly high end uh, smartphones. Today, more and more smartphones will be implemented, implemented um, 5G technology inside the flagship. And in this presentation, uh, we will see how they manage to integrate uh, such features and the main difference between the sub-6 and the millimeter wave application. So based on uh, your uh, development information, uh, the mixed architecture from 2G to 5G communication will be as described. Uh, the main disruptive uh, integration will be for the millimeter wave ap application where a dedicated based on modem, an additional antenna in package module is required. Um, but for the sub-6 technology, the implementation uh, is pretty similar to 4G, uh, 4G integration with a power amplifier integrated duplexer and a diversity uh, receiver, multiplexer, and antenna tuner. But for the last, the implementation has uh, no standard. The only common thing could be uh, the, chip the chipset uh, supplier. Here is an example of the 5G uh, smartphone that, is, that was released in uh, 2019. And uh, all features a Qualcomm chipset for the 5G implementation. Most of them are using sub-6 technology. But today, Qualcomm is not the only player in the 5G area. Others uh, like Samsung or Huawei are working internally to offer their own uh, solution. And our, in our website, uh, reverse-costing.com, we offer a various uh, teardowns of smartphones along with their block diagram and a study of all the smartphone parts. And in 2019, we identified five main suppliers for the full 5G on the smartphone market in eight major uh, smartphone series. And these suppliers uh, could be categorized in uh, three, uh, three main parts, uh, FEM or power amplifier module supplier, chipset supplier, and modem supplier. And our teardowns reveal that uh, almost 80% of the components uh, on the market in this smartphone is related to the 5G sub-6 millimeter wave is uh, taken by Qualcomm. And to study the 5G technology implementation, we have to separate this, the, these two technologies. From the baseband modem to the antenna, two paths could be taken uh, by the signal. One for the millimeter wave that goes through a single antenna modules with an integrated transceiver, and one for the sub-6 with an RFIC, commonly a transceiver, and a front-end modules featuring power amplifiers, switches, and filters. Based on our teardown, here is the two different paths in terms of components. For the millimeter wave application, uh, the smartphone has uh, two features up, can, uh, has two features up to four uh, antenna modules at each, at each side of the smartphone and a baseband modem on the main board. But for the sub-6, uh, as the architecture could be similar to the 4G, some manufacturers regroup the transceiving part for all the protocol of communication into one integrated circuit. Huawei is the only player yet to mix this uh, protocol at the modem level. Samsung and Qualcomm propose an additional modem for the, five, the, four, the 5G. And this can be seen on the silicon die size, all in the same uh, technology node. 
And indeed, Huawei has the largest DAI compared to its competitor, as it's integrated 2G, 4, 3G, 4G, and 5G into one, one, one system on chip. And when we take a look at the smartphone market, Samsung is the only player with two versions of the uh, Galaxy S10 series, sub-6 and millimeter wave. Other player choose one technology to add in its uh, smartphone. This results in only 20, 25% of the market that is compatible with millimeter wave in uh, 2019. And this number will potentially increase increase uh, next year. But in terms of modern, modern supplier, uh, Qualcomm is the main leader with almost 80% of this market, thanks to its modem that is compatible to sub-6 and millimeter wave. Different supplier means different approach, and this is what we will see in the next slides. First, First, uh, the Galaxy S10 in its uh, Korean version. This version is uh, compatible with only uh, one uh, sub-6 band based on Samsung Exynos um, 51 series. As the modem, the system integrates a dedicated transceiver and uh, integrated front-end module from Coro. In terms of area consumption, it's had 6% of the air area, and in terms of cost, 7% of the bit of materials is related to the integration of the technology. And when we take a look at the added cost, uh, it is mainly due to the, to the modem. Um, Second, it is the Qualcomm architecture in sub-6 application. For the Oppo Reno 5G, uh, again, just one uh, sub-6 band is integrated, but the integration is more complex. Indeed, along with a dedicated PMID a diverse and a diversity modules, a transceiver and its related PMIC are integrated on the, on the board. And this resulted in an increase of 7% of the RF area uh, on the board, and 9% of the bomb cost is linked to the, to the 5G. Again, here, uh, the modem has the largest part in the added cost, but uh, it's down to 70%. And third, the final architecture for the sub-6 uh, application will be for Huawei. And this, ar this architecture, this structure has two particular particularity. The first one is that all the protocol uh, communication are regrouped into one modem and one transceiver. And the second one is that Huawei decide to integrate three sub-6 band compatibility in the smartphone. And to achieve this level of complexity, more components like poor amplifier modules or filter are required, are required to that, uh, and it's a uh, result in increase of almost 10% of the RF area that is due to the 5G implementation, and also an added cost of 11% of the bomb. And here, uh, the report, the, in, with the report, this repartition, the cost of the modem is down to 60% of the added cost. And now we see in the millimeter wave part, uh, the implementation is more challenging. Several specifications like size, power, temperature has to be taken account uh, in the design. Indeed, Qualcomm has worked uh, for the past year uh, in three main aspects in order to satisfy this constraint, this, constraint, this constraint. The first approach was to integrate all the transceiving features into one system and chip to be directly integrated in uh, an antenna in package uh, module. The second aspect was the form factor that uh, drastically decreased since 2017. And the last one is related to the coverage and the hand blockage. And to get rid of these uh, problematics, the integration of multiple antennas into one smartphone seems to be the better solution. And, and this, is a, this, this is a solution that Motorola and Samsung has bring to the market in two different devices. In the Motorola Moto Mode 5G, um, four antenna modules have been integrated, two at the sides of the accessory, 
and one front and one rear facing. And in these modules, uh, also infrared proximity sensor was integrated uh, near the antenna modules to shut down the the, the one that um, that was uh, at proximity of um, a hand or, or something uh, to get uh, to avoid an unnecessary uh, power consumption or radi radi radiation exposure. Samsung took a different approach. Uh, they decided to use two different generation of antenna modules, uh, and where the form factor is not the primary uh, constraint, they took the first uh, generation. And doing so, it seems that they managed to, to be power powerful enough with only three antenna modules. And uh, the main difference between these two generations is that uh, for the first one, uh, dipole antenna was integrated in the, in the antenna in package. Here, tomographic X-ray revealed the whole structure of the component and the antenna. And we identified that the, the precise structure of the antenna patch, which are a wideband dual polarization uh, antenna system. And we also showed that the structure of the isolation between the patches has been improved uh, between the two the two the two modules. And to conclude my talk, uh, I would say that uh, with uh, its full development of chipset for millimeter wave, Qualcomm is now the leader of the 5G market, and he is the only player that provides small form factor devices for millimeter wave application, and has still ongoing development for the next generation. The first announcement uh, that we heard is that they will release a new baseband modems, the uh, X55, uh, and also a new antenna modules uh, for smartphones with a smaller form factor. But the real battle could be in the sub-6 area, where a lot of active actors in LTE applications are entering the 5G, the 5G market. The players already offer a lot of solutions for 5G applications based on traditional um, acoustic filter, mainly bow filter. But the rising of thin film saw filter could disrupt the supremacy of, bow fil of the bow filtering in this, in this band. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this uh, in-depth presentation. We will uh, continue with the last presentation from Paul Leclerc, patent and technology analyst at Nomad. This will finish the webcast just before the Q&A session. Paul, it's your turn. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone. So for the next and last part of this webcast, I'm going to talk about uh, acoustic wave filter, uh, because uh, as you know, and as Stefan said, uh, they're going to be a big part of uh, the upcoming front end module as the number of carrier and number of frequency man increases. Uh, there will be more and more uh, filters. Uh, and so today I will focus on uh, acoustic wave filters that will be used in sub six gigahertz uh, application. And we will see uh, what is happening from an IP point of view, uh, what uh, are the kind of patterns that are today filled by the, by the IP player, and we'll try to see how it would impact uh, the market on what, can, what uh, it could mean in terms of technology roadmap. So um, just to start with, uh, in fact, acoustic wave filter, it's quite old technology. So there is already a lot of patents that have already been published. There is a lot of technologies that are already uh, asserted or at least uh, protected by a patent. But um, in the last two or three years, we've seen an increase of the patenting activity related to acoustic wave, acoustic wave filter in general. And this increase uh, is due to new opportunities uh, and so are related to uh, 5G, uh, 5G development, uh, new frequency bands that push the IP player to develop new solution, and so opens many doors for a uh, player to enlarge and strengthen their, their IP position. So we'll see what kind of development are today made and explain this, this growth of the patenting activity over the last three or four years. So to start with, 
uh, we will look at uh, surface acoustic wave filter, so that's used at uh, low frequencies. And in fact, um, there is no major changing changing in the IP uh, landscape related to so filter, because as you can see from 2017 to 2019, so in the two last years, uh, the overall shape of the IP landscape remains the same. We have Murata that is still leading the uh, IP landscape. He has a very, uh, very high number of uh, patent families, so invention. And in the last two years, he has increased his patenting activity, which means that in the future, it will have more and more po power and more and more patent to uh, protect their, their product. Uh, what is interesting, however, is uh, the huge uh, push from Qualcomm that um, despite the fact that they, uh, uh, they split the joint venture with RF, uh, with TDK and the RF360, they really push their patenting activity. And today, they are uh, a very serious IP challenger for uh, other big players such as Skywalk and Tayo Yuden. Uh, TDK remains an important player uh, from a patent, patent point of view. However, um, we think that uh, they will decrease their patenting activity related to so filter for mobile application and especially onsets because um, they will probably focus on other application. Uh, in their recent patent, TDK mentioned, for example, clock, uh, system based on surface acoustic wave filter. They also provide Nato uh, um, acoustic wave filter, so they would probably uh, lose a little bit of their um, IP strength because they will maybe uh, change uh, their their orientation to a new application. But in overall, there is no major change uh, in the IP landscape. However, when we look at the technology that uh, has been developed in the last two years, we have seen several interesting uh, trends. And the first one uh, is uh, the development of new temperature composited uh, acoustic wave filter, uh, because um, back in, let's say, a couple of years ago, uh, the way people uh, used to deal with temperature drift of acoustic wave filter was to use silicon oxide in order to compensate the drift due to thermal, uh, thermal increases. However, uh, recently, Murata and also Kyocera, but there is a uh, lot of uh, other um, companies, so that Qualcomm, that look at TCSO. Um, Kyocera and Murata has developed uh, what we call thin film surface acoustic wave technology, which for us, it's a viable way to reach high frequency, so around 3 gigahertz, and to be able to address a 5G uh, frequency band. The way um, thin film surface acoustic uh, as acoustic wave rate filter work is uh, this player use in fact uh, a thin film piezoelectric material deposited on a carrier substrate with um, a different electrical properties but also uh, acoustic velocity properties. And due to the difference in acoustic velocity properties but also on the electrical properties, they manage to um, get better isolation and so to reduce the loss and uh, so increase um, the frequency, the resonant frequency of, the, of their device. So this is one of the main uh, developments that we've seen from the IP point of view. And we think that uh, to be able to increase the resonant frequency and to uh, reach uh, 5G bands, uh, this solution could be, uh, could be very interesting. The other main trade that we've seen uh, at the IP level, I, I think that's uh, a very common uh, trend for all IP players involved in the development of surface acoustic wave filter, is um, the development of, um, uh, if, of very complex uh, modular architecture. Because as you can see on the graph on the left, until 2015, most of the players look at duplexer, so only two uh, bands uh, to, to deal with. But since 2015, there is more and more, let's say, huge increase of the number of uh, patents that deal with multiplexer. Uh, now we regularly see quadplexer or triplexer or even more, 
which is in good ad uh, agreement with the, the will to develop uh, filtering module uh, that are compatible with carrier aggregation on MIMO, which is uh, a very important things for 5G application. And as you can see, uh, this trend is really driven by all the main IP and market players, such as Murata, Tayuyoden, Skyworks. We have also Coursera or Qualcomm that are really pushing into that direction. The other things that go for us in the same direction that is not shown in this presentation is a, a strong patenting activity related to wafer level packaging. Again, uh, Five years ago, most of the patents uh, really describe uh, packaging, but today most of the patents really try to um, describe wafer level packaging as the preferred uh, package. Again, this this um, uh, this kind of patent is very well suited for a very dense module with a lot of uh, filters and with a small foot which is uh, one of the big things for 5G or next, gen next generation filtering module, which should be very complex, but have to remain uh, small in terms of. So this is uh, maybe the most important uh, trend that we, seen, we see from the IP point of view is the high development of wafer level packaging and complex module architecture uh, like quadplexer. Now, if we look at uh, the bulk acoustic wave filter uh, IP landscape, so the other uh, kind of acoustic wave filter, it's a complete other story because, as you can see on the graph, um, the IP landscape is very, it's much more competitive. Um, we have, in fact, now, let's say, four main IP players, which are Broadcom, Tayoden, Qualcomm, and Zenco. Uh, Tayoden and Broadcom have been IP leaders for a couple of years now. They have a very settled IP position. They have a strong portfolio and could really uh, amper the freedom to operate of their of their uh, um, of their competitor thanks to a high number of uh, granted patents. But in the last two years, uh, Qualcomm and more specifically uh, Samsung Electromechanics have really increased their number of patents uh, related to uh, bulk acoustic wave filter. And now they have a very interesting uh, IP position because in the coming years, they will be able to compete at an IP level against Broadcom and uh, and, and entire U and especially Semco. And this could really reshuffle all the IP landscape and maybe, maybe uh, in part of the market, especially Semco has the power to, to do so. Another thing that is very interesting for us, uh, and it's also uh, a sign of a very dynamic and competitive IP landscape, is the growth on IP development of smaller IP player. Here I'm thinking about, for example, Acoustis, which is a small IP player, but uh, has a very specific technology, which is a single crystal bulk acoustic wave filter. And they really managed to uh, assert uh, to get their patent granted uh, all around the world. And they are now uh, filling patents related to uh, a filter module for wi 5G Wi Fi applications. So there is a, they, are, they have a very valuable uh, patent portfolio. And uh, in the last two years, we also seen uh, some new names, uh, let's say, uh, for, for that time, which are Infineon. And CETC, which is a Chinese uh, Chinese company, uh, that uh, have successfully entered the IP landscape and are now uh, really developing their uh, IP portfolio and developing their, their technology. So all of that show a very dynamic and competitive IP landscape, and it could be sign of uh, let's say more room to develop its technology. Uh, when we look now at uh, the, the technology described in their patent, we also see a very big difference with uh, surface acoustic wave filter because um, almost all of these players are not uh, looking at module yet, but they are really developing uh, the manufacturing step and the design of their bulk acoustic wave filter. 
And their, their main goals to do so, by doing so is to uh, increase the resonant frequency in order to uh, reach uh, high frequency and to be able to, uh, to deal with 5G application. So there is two main approaches um, that uh, have this goal. The first one is to work on the electrode. Uh, they, for example, try new materials. They also try oil, uh, alloys or their shape. And they also work on the, let's say, overall shape of the, of the filter. Uh, for example, Qualcomm has tried to um, uh, decrease the uh, energy losses in, in their filter. Uh, by pro uh, Broadcom has tried to uh, use uh, different piezoelectric materials, uh, for example, DOP, Dopped uh, aluminum nitride piezoelectric materials. So there is a lot of development at the device level in order to increase the co uh, coupling coefficient and so to increase the resonant frequency in order to reach very high frequency and to be able to address uh, 5G, um, uh, 5G, 5G bands. Uh, the other thing that we've seen from the Bo uh, filter IP landscape point of view is the development of wafer level packaging. And the, one of the main uh, aspect covers in, in a cover in, in this uh, patent is the thermal management, uh, especially how to uh, evacuate uh, the, uh, the heat. Uh, for example, Broadcom use copper pillar uh, in order to uh, reduce uh, the, the thermal drift. So again, uh, all these patents have one goal is to increase the resonant frequency and to uh, be stable and to have good performance at high frequency in order to address 5G application. But again, it's only from a device point of view. They are not uh, looking into modules. They are not looking into, for example, a very complex uh, multiplexer. It's still uh, focused on, on, the, uh, on the device it itself. So to conclude my talk, um, we've seen in the last three or four years an acceleration of the patenting activity, uh, which is driven by the main IP player. And there are two now opposite, let's say, direction. On one end, you have the surface acoustic wealth feature, which is a very mature IP landscape, uh, where uh, now people are, uh, companies are more looking into uh, complex architecture in order to uh, support carrier aggregation and to reduce the losses in, in quadplexer or multiplexers. Uh, they also have some way to uh, increase the resonant frequencies and address the 5G thanks to a thin film surface acoustic wave filter. And on the other end, you have the bulk acoustic wave filter IP landscape, which is very more competitive, where companies are still uh, developing uh, their devices and there is a lot of ongoing uh, development regarding the um, increasing performances of bow filter. And so for us, from an IP point of view, we think that uh, so filter is very, let's say, uh, blocked and very settled. Uh, there will be more and more sp space from a module point of view. However, from the bulk acoustic well filter, we think that there is still a lot of room to develop. There is a lot of room for newcomers or for a smaller IP player to develop and uh, 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 threaten their IP position. And so um, there will probably be more movement from uh, at the at the bow uh, filter level than in the so filter level in, in the coming years. Uh, thank you for your for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for your presentation. We will now conclude the webcast with a few questions, and let's begin uh, with questions to the presentation of Antoine Benadel. Right. Um, the first question: You didn't mention the impact of higher frequency of subsex new radios. What will uh, very high frequency bands change there? Well, uh, 
So yeah, indeed. Uh, so with 5G, we go up in frequency. So uh, up till now, um, it was below 3 gigahertz that you, you would find um, the, the frequency band for the telecommunications, uh, apart for, for, for Korea. But uh, uh, now, yes, we, we go higher in frequency. What it will change? Uh, for active antenna systems, for example, it will not change much before the final stage for amplification. Uh, actually, uh, gain blocks, for example, even those uh, used today in remote radio, uh, they are meant uh, they may, and made to be wideband, and they can handle uh, higher frequencies. And the same for the RF switches that will be fine in beamformers. Uh, so for the, um, the low power, uh, the low power part of the RF, uh, RF front end, it will it will not impact it uh, much. The main impact is at um, uh, final uh, amplification level. And remote, remote radio, for example, with very high power amplification, um, going uh, or higher than three gigahertz, you will need to to switch for uh, gamma-based solution, gallium nitride-based solutions, uh, as LDMOS cannot handle uh, these frequencies uh, with, uh, with very high power levels, and um, this will remain so for quite some uh, quite some time actually. Uh, for active antenna systems, it's a bit different uh, because LDMOS managed to. Uh, to go up in frequency for lower power levels, so there is uh, there, there will be a split. Uh, we expect a split for um, bands up to 3.5 gigahertz between uh, well a battle between GAN and LDMOS. But over 3.5 gigahertz, it will still be GAN that will be uh, gallium nitride that will be preferred uh, for 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 numerous reasons. Uh, so yes, in in the end, uh, the the impacts would may, uh, mostly be on the. Uh, at the final stage for application level, uh, not uh, in the rest of the of the RF front end. I hope I answered the question. Okay, good. Another question for you. Okay. Do you see millimeter waves coming to macro base station systems in the future? Oh, um, well, uh, not really. No, actually, not at. Uh, uh, millimeter waves, one of the aspects, uh, very specific aspect of millimeter waves is that they cannot propagate very well and uh, you, you have to do line of sight uh, communication with it. So uh, it means that uh, uh, if you use it uh, on, on macro, uh, macro, macro base station systems, uh, then you will need to radiate extremely high power levels to reach uh, a user who, who will be quite far. That's not uh, not possible today. Maybe in some day with a very advanced beam forming, but that's uh, well, we're very far from that. And uh, and in the end, you cannot uh, you cannot do MIMO. You cannot do uh, anything that uh, requires non line of sight uh, communication. So it should stay uh, at uh, very at small cell level, at high density small cell level, uh, and with ranges up to uh, let's say 50 meters, maybe 100. It would be it would be uh, challenging. So no, not uh, not on micro systems. Thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, now let's go to uh, questions for Stéphane from System Plus Consulting. Stéphane, first question: In the filtering side, how thin film so filter could compete with bow filters? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in terms of uh, performances, uh, first, I will say that in terms of isolation and thermal stability, uh, thin film so feature is as a real improvement compared to so feature. So it could um, get the same uh, performances or a little bit higher than both bo feature. Also, in terms of manufacturing, uh, it's only based on the surface micro machining, and there is two ways to to do the. Um, the thin film, uh, the thin film architecture. One is to grind, grind the ceramic substrate until on um, almost five hundred nanometers, but uh, it's um, it's a cost, uh, it's, a, it's costly. And the other way is to use uh, directly uh, piezoelectric on insula insulator substrate, uh, like the one supplied by um, Soitec, that could be uh, a cost efficient, cost efficient. And uh, basically, uh, compared to both feature, both feature, uh, the target is to to propose a, a, a device with a, a lower cost. So yeah, it could really disrupt the, the market in the sub six. Thank you, Stefan. The last question for you: 
For 5G, what will be the next improvement in the smartphones? Yeah, okay. Um, I think there is two main uh, maybe improvement that we will see in in the in the last uh, in the next year uh, first the first one it will be in the SOC uh, system on chip uh, sides um, like uh, Huawei what like the direction that Huawei has taken I think uh, the other one will follow uh, with the integration of the um, one modem and one transceiver that deal that deal with all the communication protocol from the 2g to the 5g and the other point of view uh, will be the improvement in the power amplifier modules. Uh, yeah, the target is to integrate more and more uh, bands into one one modules to to be power efficient and also cost efficient. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. So we will end the webcast with the question to Paul from Nomade. Uh, First question for you, Paul. Skyworks recently announced their position on both filters. However, their patent activity is quite low. Do you have any comment about that? Uh, yes. So, um, well, uh, Skyworks' position uh, on the IP level is um, a little bit surprising uh, regard regarding their recent announcement because. Uh, uh, indeed, they, they recent uh, said that they are now uh, uh, going for bulk acoustic wave filters. Uh, however, when we look at their patent activity and their, even their recent patent activity, uh, we haven't seen any sign of uh, real uh, development of the patenting activity related to uh, bulk acoustic wave filter. In fact, most of their recent patent are describing so filter or multiplexers that can use either bow or so filters. Uh, to, but it's uh, quite common for uh, for for let's say a, a player like uh, Murata on Skyworks or, or player involved in the surface acoustic wave filter IP landscape to. Uh, uh, really develop devices, um, surface acoustic wave filter patents, and to, uh, on the other hand, uh, mention bulk acoustic wave filter on their, on their uh, patents related to uh, multiplexer and duplexer, et cetera. So for us, it's very surprising to see uh, Skyworks uh, announcement uh, because uh, in our opinion, there is nothing that... Uh, uh, there is no sign that they could switch from surface acoustic wave filter to bulk acoustic wave filter, or there is no sign that they uh, have in, in a big push for, for bulk acoustic wave technology. So uh, it's very surprising for us. It's uh, We don't think that they could switch from surface acoustic wave filter to bulk acoustic wave filter that easily, and they don't have the IP that uh, go with uh, this, uh, this change. So, it's it's surprising, but and it's a bit disturbing because they don't have, let's say, the IP that go with uh, their announcements regarding both technology. That's my answer. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, last question for you. Uh, we've seen from the IP landscape that uh, sub six gigahertz five G application will be addressed by the main market players that are currently developing the SO and both technologies. Uh, do you have any ideas about the technologies and players that will lead the filter landscape for these uh, microwave frequencies? Uh, for the millimeter wave? Or micro wave? For, yeah. for the... Um, millimeter wave yes. frequencies. Ah, okay, millimeter wave. Um, yeah, um, in fact, we... we We've looked uh, at uh, the IP non-tech related to millimeter wave filter, uh, and uh, we haven't found a lot of activities uh, from many players. For example, Qualcomm or players like that don't have specific patent related to a filter addressing, for example, uh, 24 or let's say 20 to uh, 30 gigahertz, which would be the millimeter wave range in the 5G. So uh, most of the 
patenting activity, which is really dedicated to millimeter wave filter from mobile application, uh, are today done by Chinese um, institute and Chinese academic player. And we don't see a lot of thing happening at um, from major uh, companies. One explanation could be that um, we're going to switch from uh, of technology from let's say more common technology, for example, LTCC or things like that, which are also very uh, common technology where there is al already a lot of uh, patent on a lot of. Uh, of uh, inventions that have been uh, that have been published, so uh, it's very difficult for us to uh, identify and to understand the uh, IP landscape related to millimeter waves. Since uh, the, it doesn't seem that it'd be a, a very significant and specific patenting activity related to the development of uh, new new filter for for millimeter wave uh, application. So today we cannot we, we cannot say anything about the players, the technologies that could emerge because uh, there is no sign of specific development for, from a patent point of view. Again, thank you, Paul. So the webcast is now over. You will soon receive by email the link to the recorded session, as I mentioned earlier. Also, please feel free to share this presentation with some colleagues. And finally, also let me remind you that you can find all these reports on our website, i-micronews.com. And do not also contact, uh, do not hesitate to contact us. And if you have additional questions, you have the uh, contact details on the last slide of the presentation. Thanks a lot for joining us today, and have all of you a good day. Bye-bye.